thank you for having me. So I am coming from the Department of Software and Information System Engineering at uh, Ben Gurion University, which is uh, the youngest university in Israel. And in during this talk, I'm going to give some review on the development that we had in the field of recommendal system. Actually, the field of recommendal system has uh, started almost 20 years ago to take a, a trend uh, in parallel to the idea of uh, Google Metrics and PageRank that was uh, introduced by uh, the Google uh, founders. So just to make sure that we are all in the same page, uh, let's look what is recommender system. So the, the idea of recommender system is to help users that don't have the time or the competence to go over millions of items that e-commerce sites now uh, suggest. So in its most simplest form, actually recommender system provide a personalized rank list of items. Maybe the first uh, large-scale example of recommender system is that of Amazon, which used about almost 20 years ago a very simple pattern that recommend item based on other users. You probably all see that when you are watching on a certain item, you get a recommendation that is based on people who bought this item also bought the following items. But recommender system can be found in many other websites. For instance, when you are watching YouTube, once the video is over, you automatically get the next video, right? And this, this is done by a recommender system. Or even if you are doing search in Google, right? If you are looking for a certain term, for instance, in this case, I, I looked for Isaac Newton, you get other uh, related search terms with Albert Einstein and, and so on. So actually, recommender system is very popular and can get a very uh, effective for uh, increasing the sales of companies. This is some statistics that, that are coming from uh, the e-commerce uh, websites like Amazon. 35% of increase oh, of uh, purchases are being done from uh, recommender systems. 20% from Alibaba. And if you are looking at the video uh, field, the, the percentage is even higher. In case of YouTube, 70% of the clicks are coming from recommendation, and in Netflix, it's 75%. So just to give you some uh, a, a, a short history of the rise of the recommender system, the idea of recommender system was uh, coined in the early of 90s, but at the beginning, it was part of the information retrieval community with a very uh, small number of papers that actually deals with recommender system. The change or the emergency uh, has been created in 97 when Professor Paul Resnick has uh, published a special issue in the communication of the ACM regarding recommender system. And since then, we can see a very clear increase in the number of publication in the field of uh, recommender system. Maybe another important uh, milestone was the competition of Netflix. I will talk about that later. It did a lot of public relation to the field of recommender system. And a year later, a, a, a special a conference of the ACM called the ACM Rexis have been established. And since then, it's attracted a lot of people that are working in the field of recommender system. You can see it with the number of publications that have been published in each one of the years. Um, so there are a lot of recommendation models that can be used. I will t mainly talk about collaborating filtering, which is actually a bipartite graph that we are trying to, to solve. But other models exist as well, like the content-based models, knowledge-based techniques, community-based techniques, context-aware recommender system, and some companies are actually doing a, a hybrid solution that combines several different approaches for recommendation. But probably the most common one is the collaborating filtering. And the idea of collaborating filtering is very simple. It's actually, we try to predict the opinion of a user regarding a new item based on the user's previous <coughs> opinions on other items. 
and the opinions of similar uh, users to that items. Now, specifically, collaborating filtering can be defined in different ways. It really uh, depends on the input that we are given. It can be rating data, when a user actually give rate for an item. This is, for example, what, what was, uh, it was the setting in the Netflix uh, price. <laughs> but usually in many uh, real systems, you get what we call event data, where a user uh, uh, click an item, purchase an item, add to a cart, and so on. And so when we are talking about data, we should also uh, differentiate between the explicit feedback, where a user provide the rating or the like-dislike, and implicit feedback, like when a user uh, click on an item. It doesn't actually say that he likes the item, right? It just says that he was interested uh, now on that item. And of course, in order to define the collaborating filtering task, we can also look at the goals of our system. Uh, one of them can be rating prediction, like in the case of uh, the Netflix uh, price, but there are other kind of goals that can be used, for instance, purchase prediction or top end recommendation and many others. So it's the actual setting of the problems uh, uh, indicate which way we are going to solve it, in, in what way we are going to solve it. In any case, we are giving, of course, a matrix that from one dimension we have the users, in the other dimension we have the, the items. And the most important thing about that matrix is that it's probably going to be very sparse because we have a lot of items, we have a lot of users, and usually users provide only a, a, a feedback only for very few number of items. So most of the matrix is going to be sparse. Now, from a graph point of view, what we have here is bar power type graph. From one hand, we have the users. From the other hand, we have the items, in this case, the movies. And the edges holds the, uh, the rating that the user gave to an item. And usually, what we are trying to solve, we, we define some loss function. Uh, the most popular one is a root mean squared error, which we try to uh, compare the actual rating with uh, the predicted rating that our system uh, gives. And we try, of course, to minimize that. There are several techniques to solve that. In the 90s, the most popular one was the nearest neighborhood. Now, it's a very trivial way to solve the problems, but it's still very effective. Actually, you, with the very sh uh, small uh, short lines of code, you can get very effective recommendation. Uh, so this is was the, the main approaches that have been used in, uh, in the 90s. Then, starting from 2003, uh, matrix factorization became very popular to solving collaborating filtering tasks. And of course, in the last few years, you all heard about deep learning, and I will talk also about that. It's actually a way to generalize the matrix factorization methods. And of course, getting uh, even better results. So if we are talking about the first approach, the nearest neighborhood, we can solve it either as a user-to-user -user model when we create a similarity matrix between the users based on their opinion on different items, or we can build item-to-item -item model where we compare uh, to, uh, every pair of items based on, their, uh, on the opinion that user gave about this, these items. Now, uh, using the nearest neighborhood can be done in two different approaches. The first one is actually using a predefined similarity measures, like the Pearson correlation, Hamming distance, cosine similarity, and so on, uh, which is very easy to, to implement. Another approach, which provides even better results, is to learn the similarity using, of course, uh, optimization. Uh, the optimization in our case, as, uh, as we said, is the minimization of the root mean squared error. So just to give you an example, if we are using the Hamming distance and we are giving a user with some uh, feedback that he gave on different items, and we would like to give a, a prediction whether he would like uh, item number two, which is now indicated as a red, we take all the user in the database that has rated item number two, and we calculate the Hamming distance 
for each one of them. And the, the most similar one, we take that user and get his prediction, uh, his rating, and use it as our prediction for the current user. Which is, of course, a very simple approach. Usually, we are not using only the, the most nearest one, but we combine the top k nearest user. Th but that is a very simple approach. And a better approach is to learn the similarity. And in order to do that, we first define the baseline uh, prediction for the rating, which is what you see here. With the it it's contains both the average rating, the user actual offset from the usual uh, rating, and the item offset <coughs> uh, of that specific item. And we can try to uh, create a model by taking this baseline and add to that baseline the, the offset that we have from the actual rating and the, and the baseline of other items multiplied by the weight or the similarity between these two items. And WIJ is, of course, the variables that are need to be found using an optimization by trying to solve for instance, the minimization problem that we see here at the bottom. Now, of course, we can solve it in a different way. Usually, we can use stochastic gradient descent to find uh, these Ws. So this is uh, the, the nearest neighbor. The second approach that was developed during the, uh, it got a popularity in 2003, is the singular value decomposition or matrix factorization. In order to understand why it became so popular, we need to look at the uh, Netflix price. I hopefully, most of you already heard about that. It was uh, uh, started on 2006 when Netflix uh, defined the price of $1 million, which is a lot of money. And they gave a, a training data set of 100 million ratings coming from almost half million of users and 18,000 movies. And they had a qualifying set that was uh, divided into two halves. One of them is the test set that was used for determining the winners of the competition. And we had also the quiz set that is used to calculate the leaderboard that was uh, uh, updated ongoingly. And the goal was actually, in my opinion, was very modest. Only improve their existing algorithms by 10%, which doesn't look like a very tough uh, task. It's actually reducing the root mean square error from 95 to 85. Well, but it took to many teams about three years to reach that threshold. And after almost three years, there was the first team that called Belcor. They succeeded, as you can see here, to get the threshold improvement of 10%. I actually, or, uh, at that time, when I saw that, I called my friend uh, Koren, which is one of the members of Belcor. I gave him my, my congratulations. But then, 20 minutes later, another team succeeded to break this threshold, the team that is called Ensemble. Uh, you can see only 20 minutes between these two teams. Both of them succeeded to reach this threshold almost at the same time. There was a bit of uh, dispute, but eventually uh, the first team got the, the price of $1 million. Uh, anyway, there are several uh, lessons that have been learned from this uh, Netflix prize. Uh, first of all, uh, competition is a very good way for companies uh, to outsource their challenges. You probably all know today Kaggle, right? That was purchased by Google, I think a year ago, that actually companies can uh, submit their uh, task and many people are trying to, to solve it. Uh, so this is one good thing for companies. Uh, another thing is that they got a very nice public relation. I mean, many people deal with that Netflix uh, prize. And it's a very good way to hire top talent people if they succeed to solve the task. Anyway, based on this competition, SVD became the method of choice in collaborating filtering. And actually, from that moment, 
every paper needed to use SVD as part of the solution, right? Only because of the Netflix price that make that uh, method very popular. Uh, another important lesson is that if you want to win a competition, you need to ensemble different models together to do some averaging of that. And regularization is very crucial in order to uh, avoid overfitting of the, of the model. And another uh, result from that competition was that if you have enough data, all the uh, information of the content feature, like in this case, the genre or the actors of the movies, doesn't really, uh, it was not found to be useful. It's actually useless. It's, uh, which is very surprising. I mean, you have information about the movies, you have information about the users, but you, if you want to get a, a very high accuracy, you don't uh, need to use them to make the, the prediction. Again, this is true only if you have enough data, enough, of enough rating data. And another lesson is that uh, methods that were developed as part of the competition usually are not practical in real life because they are too complicated to be used on a, on a daily basis. Anyway, the, idea of, uh, the basic idea of uh, uh, SVD is to take the, this bipartite graph and introduce some latent factor in the middle that both the users and the items can be uh, related to them. And mathematically, this means that we take the original matrix of the rating and we decompose it into two matrices that by multiplying them, we can reproduce the original rating and making prediction of new uh, rating as, as well. Basically, what we are doing is we embed both the users and the items to the same latent space, new space that we have discovered using this model. Now, there are several ways to do the factorization that are beca became pe popular in collaborating filtering. Uh, we can use the classic SVD. We can use the low rank factorization. I think this is the most popular one in collaborating filtering. Or we can use a, a codebook decomposition where the U and V are a permutation matrix, and I will talk about that. They, it can be used for doing transfer learning between different uh, domains. In any case, our problem is very uh, simple. We have uh, two matrices U and V that need to be found. We have some loss function. Usually we are using the mean squared error. Again, uh, not always because it's the right measure, but just because it's easy to optimize this uh, measure. And it's a good proxy for the real measures that we are interested in. And Usually, most of the people are using the most simplest uh, uh, optimization methods like the stochastic gradient descent. Now, when we are trying to solve the collaborative filtering, there are three main issues that need to be addressed. The first one that we already mentioned is the sparseness of the, of the matrix, that most of the matrix is, is sparse. We have the issue of long tail. This means that many items that are located in the long tail have only few rating. And we also have the problem that we called cold start, where certain users or certain items don't have enough data for us to make a, a good prediction regarding them. So we need to address these issues. And one way that we did in order to, to address these issues was to use transfer learning. Now, in classic machine learning, what we have, we create a model from, from scratch for each one of the sources that we have. For instance, if we are making a recommendation for movies, we create a model for movies. If we make a, a recommendation for books, we create a different model for books and so on. What we can do with transfer learning is to take several source domains, we create their models, and then extract some of the knowledge and use it for solving a new target domain. And the nice thing about that is that you can do transfer learning without sharing anything between the two domains. What I mean is that we don't share neither the users nor the items. But still, there are several patterns that can be found in both of the domains. 
both the, in the source and in the target. So how we can do that? And in order to, to, to do transfer learning, we can use the uh, factorization of a uh, codebook, which we have a permutation matrix for the user and a permutation matrix for the items, and we have the codebook in the middle. And based on these two permutation matrix, we actually can provide a prediction for the rating. Right? So the idea of codebook transfer is the following one. We take the rating matrix, the original rating matrix, both in the source and in the target domain. We are doing permutation of both of them. And from that permutation, we try to extract the codebook, which is every cell in the codebook is actually the average of all the relevant cells in the original uh, matrix. And hopefully, what we can find is that some of the part of the codebook can be shared with a second domain, the target domain. Why does it make sense? Just to, to have an idea, let's look at the following codebook matrix. And let's look, for instance, on a certain user. What we can say about that user? This user is actually doesn't like to give compliment. He actually gives rating for usually of one or two. He never gives a rating of four or five, right? And this type of users can be found in different domains. You can find it in, in games, you can find it in movies, you can find it in, in, in books, right? It's, it's a type of a user. Or if you are looking at a certain item, what we can say about that item? that we are talking about controversial items. Sometimes people like him, like that item, and other people really dislike this item. And again, this is a type of a pattern that can be found in different domains. So the idea of codebook transfer is, is that it is you need less data to reuse existing patterns than finding them or discovering it from scratch. So one of the methods that we have de developed, uh, we call it uh, Talmud. Talmud in Hebrew is a uh, learning, and it's tried to do a transfer learning from multiple domains to a, a target domain. And our objective was, like always, uh, the mean squared error. In this case, we have the, the actual rating from the target domain, and we try to make a prediction based on several codebooks that came from different source domains. For each one of them, we need to find the permutation matrix, the relevant permutation matrix of that domain, U and V. And we have alpha that represent the relatedness of each one of the source domains to the target domain. And in order to solve that, actually, we use a very simple algorithm. We begin by finding the codebook of each one of the source domain using co-clustering algorithms. Once we do that, we, we started to find the the permutation matrix of the user items and the, and the alpha uh, coefficient. In order to do that, we first uh, freeze the item permutation matrix and the alpha, and we solve the problem for the user permutation. Then, given that, we freeze the user permutation and the alpha and find <coughs> the item permutation matrix. And finally, we found the uh, alpha values, alpha vector. And we repeat this uh, method until we get uh, a, a good result. Now, one thing that we found out is that it's not a good idea to use all the sources domain at once and create them prediction model. So a, a, a better way is like what we are doing in a simple regression task. When we add each one of the source domain gradually, we try uh, we, we begin with, the, with the, the first best source domain, and then we add the next one, and so on, until we see that we cannot, we cannot improve the results anymore. And in order to do that, the, best, uh, the, the simplest way to do that is to take the training data, split it to training and validation. When training was used to find the permutation matrix and the alpha coefficient, while the validation was used in order to indicate whether this, this source domain can be useful to this uh, target domain. And 
We did some tests on that. We, we took some very popular public data set that are relatively uh, with a lot of rating, like the Netflix, movie lens, and so on. And we tested it on, on different target domain that we had that are relatively small. In, in other words, you don't have enough data on those uh, target domain. And what we have found is that this uh, method that we have developed could actually help us to reduce the, the loss function in all of the cases when we compare it to uh, existing uh, method that have been very popular on that time. Another thing that we found out with that algorithm is what we call the course of uh, sources, like the course of dimensionality. When you add more sources, actually the training error goes down all the time, but the test error goes down until a certain stage and then uh, started to increase. So we need to actually we need to actually go, we add sources until we see that uh, adding a new source actually uh, increase the error. So this is a very important aspect in, in the algorithm. So this is a, was the era of uh, uh, SVD, but then a few years ago, uh, the idea of deep learning ca came and uh, did some uh, changes in our field as well, in collaborating filtering. And first of all, giving a computational graph, like uh, many systems uh, provide, like TensorFlow and so on, uh, first of all, the SVD can be implemented using that uh, framework. In order to do that, we uh, represent both the user and the items as one hot vectors, and then we convert them or to an embedded vector, and we need, of, of course, finding the matrix that convert from one hot to the to that embedded vector. Once we did that, we had an operation of dot product and we get the prediction of our rating. And based on this computational graph, we can find, uh, of course, the best representation of both the user and the items. But actually, the fact that we can solve now in a very efficient way any computational graph uh, led to the following architecture which start almost the same. We are having the user uh, one hot vector and the item one hot vectors. We are doing the, these two embedding. By the way, uh, in this case, instead of using dot product, we just concatenate the vector of the user and the item. Uh, this allows us also to have a different embedding vectors, uh, different size of embedding vectors for the user and the item. And then we have several layers of uh, of this is the reason why it's called the uh, deep learning, and we get the, the prediction. Now, the amazing thing about that is, uh, this is uh, something that was published in a, one blogger has published, a very nice code, how you get uh, the price of Netflix, but only these few uh, lines of code. It was using uh, Keras above uh, the TensorFlow framework, and as you can see, it the, the blogger don't even try to do hyperparameter optimization. It used a very simple uh, definition or the default values, and it still get the best results when compared to the Netflix uh, price 10 years ago. So this is actually demonstrate the power of uh, deep learning in collaborating filtering uh, tasks. Now, another thing that we can do with uh, Deep learning is the idea of item to vec, which in which we are trying to embed the items into a, into a new space, and then we can answer different questions based on that uh, embedding. In that case, of course, what we are looking for is that the item similarity will be a, a proxy for the vector simil or maybe we should define it in, in, in the other way around. The vector similarity should uh, represent the item similarity. Uh, we learn these vectors from the user's session, and inspired by the world of vec that uh, Lacun has uh, presented in the first day, uh, instead of words, we actually have the items, the, num the catalog number of the items, and instead of sentences, we actually have the user session. 
when a user came to a system, usually he, 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 the user doesn't look on a one item, but actually is looking on several items. And we can use this session, the sequence in the session, as our sentence, the analogy of a sentence. Now, in order to create this embedding, we can use the same idea of a continuous bag of items in which we, for instance, in this case, we have, I'm not sure if you can see it so well. Anyway, what we have here is we're taking a window, in this case, of size 2. So in total, we have a session of five items where uh, the first two items and the last two items are used as an input. And we try to predict item, num item number three at, at the middle based on that uh, on the context of the of this, the first two and the uh, the last two items, and in order to do that, we can uh, again start with the uh, one hot encoding of each one of the items. We try to find uh, uh, two matrices, this one and this one. The first one need to uh, convert the hot one hot vector into an embedded representation of all the items. And this one try to do the opposite, uh, convert from the embedded uh, representation into one hot representation of the target items. Okay. And in order to do that, again, we need to find to solve the, the problems, usually using a stochastic uh, gradient descent. We find the, these two uh, metrics. Based on that, we can represent each one of the hot, uh, of each one of the items as a embedded uh, vectors, we can aggregate these vectors and then try to convert it using the second matrix uh, to predict which is what is the missing items between these uh, two items. Now, some interesting results that we get from this uh, very simple approach of item uh, to vec is that, and again, Please keep in mind that the algorithm didn't get any information regarding item title or the description of the item, but still we can get a very interesting results. Like uh, the, the most trivial one is when you give it a certain item, like uh, in this case it was Galaxy S7 or a certain model, it get as a similar items other uh, models of the same S7 uh, something. But even more interesting is that we can answer analogy like in the case of words. You can do something like that. Uh, if you take Apple phone, uh, iPhone model 5C minus Apple iPhone 4S plus Samsung Galaxy S5 Edge, what you get? Can you guess? Galaxy 4. Galaxy 6 in this case, right? Because you are a Right, we are reducing the, the old one and then add the, the new one, so you get the, the new version of Galaxy. Now, the reason that you got this uh, interesting result is because for each one of the items, you have other items that are, uh, can be related. One of, uh, some of them are common to the uh, models that came from iPhone, like uh, you can see here the Apple EarPods that are common to both iPhone 5 and I iPhone 4. Uh, or on the other hand, you have Samsung charger cable that are common for Galaxy 5 and 6, right? But at the same time, you can find uh, some items that are related to the new model, like the Nano SIM, that is both related to iPhone 5 and Galaxy S, uh, 6S. And you have items that are related to the old model, like the micro -sip. So because of that, because of these related items that you can find in the, in the, in the catalog, you can actually get this uh, nice analogy uh, results from the, from the data. So I will uh, try to uh, sum up what we are doing right now in, this, uh, in the last uh, two years. First of all, uh, the community of recommender system are pretty good in uh, creating a uh, high accur uh, or accurate results. But uh, most of the prediction or recommendation that we give are, are very trivial. And we are still trying to find out uh, ways to provide better results uh, either by providing diversity 
or providing serendipity in the, in the recommended items that we provide to the user. So, so we'll be able to give a additional value to the user and not only the trivial uh, recommendation. Another thing that we have found out and we are working on that in the last uh, three years is how to uh, incorporate the price as part of recommender system. Actually, every user has some price sensitivity and it really depends on, on, the, on the user and the target items. As a user, I might be very uh, uh, sensitive to the price when I'm buying a laptop, but not sensitive when I'm buying a cellular phone. Okay, so we need to learn this sensitivity uh, patterns for each user and based on that, making the, the recommendation. So we did uh, some work with eBay on that uh, issue. Another uh, thing that we are working on is the, uh, how to make the recommendation, uh, how to explain the results of the recommendation so the user can have more trust on the, on the recommended items that he gets from, uh, automatically from the system. Uh, the another uh, important item that we are now working on that is how to uh, counter-react uh, the fact that Today, if you are looking at the recommender system about 10 years ago, many of the websites didn't have a recommender system. So uh, all the data that have, that have been collected was organic uh, uh, traffic of the user. Nowadays, they already have recommender systems. So actually, most of the activity of the users are not organic, but actually are affected by the fact that you have a recommender system. So you need a way to understand what is the organic behavior of the user and what came from the, the, Im implement the already implemented recommender system. And it's very difficult task to do this, uh, the composition. A and the last thing that we are working in is uh, how to use a recommender system for domains that need background knowledge. I will give you some example about that. For instance, we have a project of AutoML, Automatic Machine Learning when we're trying to recommend the best algorithm to a certain problem, giving uh, our background knowledge that have been collected for many papers that were published uh, in the field of uh, machine learning. So giving a problem, giving the description of, of the problem and the data of the problem, we're trying to automatically find you the best algorithm to run on that problem. It's a, it's a way to automate the process of, of data science. Another example that we are using in, in the case of knowledge-based recommender system is to uh, recommend a medical procedure based on your current uh, medical uh, record that you have. Again, this is a, a domain that needs a lot of background knowledge in order to make that recommendation. It's much more harder than uh, making a recommendation for uh, movies or uh, or games. Uh, so that's it. If you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 have I have two questions. Yeah. The, the first one is um, uh, about just a technical point about yeah. using deep learning for a singular value decomposition. Um, it's not the best way to do that. I ju just uh, actually. I wanted to show that it can be done with computational graph. It's definitely not the best way to do that. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, but it's, it shows that computational graph can <laughs> generalize the idea of SVD. Nobody really do it in that way, if you are asking uh, the question. Practically, no one do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, was, that was kind of my question. Yeah. I was, but I was wondering if even for very, very large uh, matrices, whether it, it it turns out to be a, a reasonable approach. Wh which one? The, the Deep learning for SVD. Uh, if you, you're asking if it is reasonable, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. sure. I, even for a large one, I'm, I'm not sure that this, this is the best way to, to deal with that. Uh -huh. I mean, probably writing your uh, specific code for SVD will be better in this case. Because there are some tricks that uh, 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 general computational graphs do don't take into consideration. Yeah. But but the, the, the slide just was to show that it's, it's it, yeah it's possible. It's yeah. possible, by the way, if you try to do that, 
it, you will see that it, it takes a very long period of time to, to get a, the results. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not the, the best way to, to solve it. It's, it, but it, there's a lot of research. It's hard to parallelize SVD, but you can right. parallelize yeah, the deep cool. learning right, right. aspect. And so but still, uh, uh, at least from my experience, uh, computational graphs are, are, are not the best solution for the, for the SVD. OK, may, may I ask my second question? Yes. <laughs> so so I, I was struck by um, with your code book approach for matrix factorization. It reminded me of the discussion in a previous talk about when using deep learning to try and do translation, mm -hmm, that they right. were really trying to find a, an underlying um, commonality, something common between all languages, and then map all languages to that. Right. It reminded me of your... Yeah, 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 yeah. You, are, you are totally right. Yeah. I, I wondered whether you have sort of um, thought about doing it a code book like plan, but with the deep learning recommender system. Yeah, we actually are now doing it. Uh, I have a PhD student that is, she's trying to do that, exactly that, but with the deep learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and we got a very encouraging results right now. So yeah, you're all absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, Yes, the, uh, do, do you know, because the price of Netflix price uh, stopped in 2009. Yeah. Do you know if uh, with, with the big evolution and uh, new algorithms, what kind of accuracy can we achieve uh, now with the same... Uh, uh, yeah, you still can, uh, first of all, Netflix, uh, just, to, just to let you know, the, the test uh, part, I, I, there, th there is the qu uh, qualifying uh, data set, uh, maybe I will go back to that. Where it is? Sorry, a lot of animation. <laughs> uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, actually, what we can do now is only test the quiz set because the test set is is unknown, actually. But it's a very good estimation to the the real results. Because we saw it all the time that in the leaderboard there is a good relation uh, correlation between the quiz set and the test set that was not published uh, by the Netflix. So you can still, of course, take the SVD that was developed by uh, Yuda Koren and his uh, co-authors and use it. But as, as I saw, as I uh, have shown, uh, other methods like the deep learning can do it much faster. I mean, and we can uh, go above. Uh, 10%? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's go, it's go, uh, it's improved even more than 10%. And, and the, uh, when you do transfer learning, you do only the domain adaptation, not uh, because the, in transfer learning we have a multitask learning mm -hmm. and the domain adaptation. And, uh, I see that you only. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, uh, in, in that case, we, we did only the domain adaptation. You are right. Thank you very much. Um. How do you deal uh, with new products or incoming products? Because if you have uh, a user buy an old pro product, uh, you cannot uh, pr uh, propose an old uh, product. Yeah. So you yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the, what I call the cold start problem of both the user and the items. So I if you actually have a really new user without any interaction, the best way you can do is uh, use uh, what we call popularity based on demographic. Meaning, uh, take the most popular item for people that came from a certain country. This is probably the, the first uh, uh, prediction that I can give you. But after I have several interaction, I can use collaborative filtering for providing a, a recommendation. And the idea of transfer learning is actually is, uh, is a very good way to do that. What we have shown, the, the idea of uh, code, uh, code book transfer, you can do it not only between domains, but also in domains. Taking from one area that is, is relatively dense and do transfer to a, an area that is relatively sparse. So you can do the, the, the same trick in, in domain. And this is a, a very effective way to deal with both user, uh, cold start user and cold start item, but again, you can do that after you have some interaction. Without any interaction, it's very, very hard to, to make a, 
a prediction. Um, yeah, so I was uh, really shocked by uh, the figures you gave at the beginning as 75 people. Uh, uh, don't remember. In the Netflix, yeah, in the Netflix. Yeah, I'm also uh, in shock, but, but l let me give you some intuition why it's work. Uh, for instance, in YouTube, when you are watching a movie, the chance that you will see the next movie that is automatically played is very high. Yeah. I, in my case, I usually watch a movie and then I get the, the recommendation and goes with it, right? I mean, the question is the following. So, um, given that these um, recommendation <coughs> systems uh, take as input uh, knowledge that come from user choice, uh, mm -hmm. if user choice become uh, uh, recommended by the system itself, uh, then uh, there are uh, uh, issues that uh, maybe spring will end up uh, in a like a bubble. Yeah, yeah. You, you. Opa. I'm sorry. Are there ways to detect uh, this kind of phenomena in? Uh yeah, yeah. This is uh, just a second. This is actually item number four here. The fact that you don't have organic behavior of the user. It's it's really affected by the current recommender system. Now, it's very difficult. It's not a, a, a simple issue. Uh, companies like Netflix, I, I actually asked them how they are uh, trying to uh, address this issue. One way to do that is that you don't only get a recommendation by the system, you get also random recommendation, mm -hmm. just as a way to learn more about you. So it's, a, it's, a, it's usually uh, the idea of active learning, that you are trying to learn for uh, something that is, uh, even if you, you know that this is not the best choice right now, you still uh, suggest that item. Yeah, but, but it's a very difficult challenge. It's, it's not an easy task. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that there is a... Ways of detecting uh, the, the fact that uh, um, the user are not taking the Based choices, uh, choices which are not actually the best, or ways of uh, figure. Say, for example, some bestseller may become a bestseller just because of a recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, you are absolutely, <laughs> you are absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I, I'm not aware of uh, of a good solution for that problem. Uh, yeah, but it's. It's an issue. <laughs> yeah, like, like the fake news, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I was wondering what was the impact for the newer generation that always grew up with recommender system, whether the, the set having organic choices still makes sense to them. Yeah, yeah, they, they still make sense, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure about that. Uh, again, s some of the websites are trying to combine both uh, organic uh, uh, suffering of, of the website with the recommendation in order to create more and more organic uh, behavior of the user. But I'm not sure that they really succeeded to, to solve this issue. Uh, can, you, can you explain what you mean by organic? Organic, it means that the user decided to go to that item. It's not was, it was not recommended by the system. It, it's his own decision to do that. And when a recommender system always give you a choice, sometimes you, you take them, even if it was not really your opinion about them. So um, it was m it's my understanding that um, Netflix these days and other companies like Salesforce mm -hmm. are, aren't using things like the user's <coughs> ratings of past movies, but are using have shifted entirely to behavioral data. Yeah, they, 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 they know what you've watched, they know where the mouth uh, Exactly, is. exactly. They event, I, w what we call event data. Yeah. yeah, because you have much more data of events than data of rating. You're, you are absolutely right. And, and so, so in, in your research, are, are you able to use some of that data? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, again, because of the Netflix prize, uh, people are usually taking the, the rating as, as the most important one, but I totally agree with you. You have much more data that is event-based data. And one way to do that is to uh, give a different uh, uh, weight to different kind of 
event that you had. For instance, uh, if you have a purchase event, it's more important than adding an item to the cart or uh, view the item page and so on. And you can learn uh, the effect of each one of the event as a way to predict the purchase of, of an item. Yeah, we do that. We do that all the time. By the way, the, the idea of codebook can be used for that as well. You can imagine, because instead of having different sources, you have different kind of event. You have one matrix for the purchase event, one matrix for the uh, uh, item uh, page view, and so on. And usually what we are trying to do is to predict the purchase matrix, which is relatively sparse, based on all other matrices, like a, a view page item, which are uh, much more dense than that uh, event. And, and you can do this idea of transfer learning between the, the two, two different type of events. Mm -hmm. More questions? I can end with maybe just a, a, a remark, which is, you know, here at, uh, you know, Thibaut de Moore last night he gave a, a talk in, in Paris and, and he, he, he said something about how human contact is really important and that you know having a face-to-face -face meeting is much better than a mm. Skype meeting. Mm. And it makes me wonder in the context of recommender systems whether all the little bookstores that had experts that could recommend personally you, the next book for you to read might, might not be better than Amazon's automatic system. Uh, by the way, th this is a, we have a community-based recommender system which is trying to look what your friend likes and basically, or actual friends, and based on them making a recommendation, uh, it's still not uh, the most uh, popular way to do that. Uh, again, it's very hard to beat uh, collaborating filtering. When you're doing testing, you will always find out that collaborating filtering is, is much better than the existing uh, methods, mm -hmm. the, the other uh, methods. More no questions? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you about again about this organic uh, uh, and induced uh, purchase. Uh, this one kind of data which is more organic than what we are using of uh, its uh, searches. It's, it's data for searches mm -hmm. and uh, and particularly. <laughs> If you start your your session uh, 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 by searching uh, uh, for some item, it's a, a part. It's uh, it's it's a it's essentially a more organic than other. I, I totally agree with you. By the way, Google is doing that, but unfortunately, the search data is usually only Google have it, right? Or or other companies like uh, Facebook, but for most website, e-commerce site, they don't have enough search data that can be used for that. So this is the reason why a small company, uh, let's call it not a small companies, but a, a, a companies without a search engine need to use uh, the idea of, of uh, collaborating filtering. More questions? Yeah, uh, I have one last question. Yeah, you, sure. you mentioned uh, some algorithms are good at winning challenges, but not good in, in okay. practice. So what's your opinion? Which are the algorithms for the challenges and, and which are the practical algorithms? I, I think w when we are talking about practical, it needs to be, first of all, you need to train it in a very uh, efficient way. It cannot take uh, weeks of uh, computational power to, to create the model. This is actually what happened in the Netflix price. They used a very uh, accurate model, but it took weeks to, to train it. This is one thing. The other thing is that you also need to provide a recommendation in in timely manner. And again, the, the solution that they have used is a good for overall prediction. But if you would like to give a prediction for a given user that is right now in your website, their method was not a very uh, effective in, in doing that. So again, in practical life, you need to to address that as well. Yeah. <coughs> Just a question about the data, the data sets. I'm very surprised with the recommendation uh, in general. They don't ask you feedbacks, okay, where uh, our recommendation okay <coughs> or not. 
Ah, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, aspect <coughs> of developing the, the data sets which would give a better... Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are a few data sets with the uh, uh, user feedback that were asked whether the recommendation is good or not. Uh, we actually, even in our university, we did some collection of this kind of data where we ask the users if the recommendation is good or not. But again, it's very difficult to collect such data with the millions of, of users. It's much more uh, easier to take the event data, which you already have in, in any case. Uh, one thing that we have uh, learned from collecting the data is that users are biased to the way you report the recommendation. I mean, if you say to a user, I recommended that because I am quite sure that you will like it, then the user think that, is, that the recommendation is good. Although, by the way, we created a random recommendation. <laughs> so users are biased to the way you present the, the results, which is amazing for me. It was. <laughs> no more questions then we can have lunch and thank you very much again. thank you